Who was the first person to prove the world was round? And how did they do it? Believe it or not, you have to go back 2,300 years. That's 1,600 years before we had ships that could sail across the world, 1,400 years before the invention of the compass, 1,000 years before gunpowder, and 800 years before the invention of the number zero. 2,300 years ago lived a Greek man named Eratosthenes. Eratosthenes was a scholar who lived in ancient Alexandria. That was the northernmost tip of Egypt. He was the head librarian at the Great Library of Alexandria. You know, the one that burned down. Back then people had all manner of stories about what the earth was. Some thought it was flat, some round. A few were beginning to say that the earth went around the sun, but most thought that it was the other way around. Being a scholar and a curious man, Eratosthenes found that one day something strange had happened. He'd heard about a little town far to the south of Alexandria in modern day Aswan, and he heard that on the summer solstice the sun shone directly down. You could look down into a well and there would be no shadows whatsoever. In Alexandria there were always shadows at noon. For most people who even noticed something like that, it was just a curiosity. The sun shines straight down once a year, who cares? But Eratosthenes knew he was onto something. The shadows were telling him a story. Most people couldn't speak the language of shadows because shadows only speak one language. That's the language of the universe. They were presenting us with a puzzle every day and Eratosthenes could tell what that puzzle was because he spoke the language that could decode the message. I'm talking about mathematics. On the summer solstice in Alexandria he measured the angle of the shadow cast by a stick at noon. The shadow's angle was 7.2 degrees. Now if the earth was flat the shadow should have been straight down. It would be the same in Aswan as it was in Alexandria, right? But why were they different? Eratosthenes had just figured out that the earth was curved. So now Eratosthenes knew something other people had only guessed at. He knew it for certain. But could he take it further? Could he prove not only that the earth was curved, but how big it was as well? And the only way, the only tool he had accessible to him was the difference in two shadows. How do you even do that? Step one, he hired a bematist. Now a bematist is a professional trained to measure distances by walking. This bematist walked the distance from Alexandria to Aswan, which would take more than a month of walking. And he did it in as straight a line as possible over whatever terrain and dangers the wilds of ancient Egypt had. This is no small feat. But the man came back to Eratosthenes and told him the distance between Aswan and Alexandria. It was 800 kilometers or just under 500 miles. Now Eratosthenes didn't have to figure out the mathematics to understand the rest himself. He already stood on the shoulders of giants. All he had to do was use simple geometry laid down by people like Pythagoras to calculate that if 7.2 degrees represented the distance between the two cities, then 360 degrees, the full circle of the earth, must be about 50 times that distance. Multiply 800 kilometers by 50 and Eratosthenes concluded that the earth's circumference was roughly 40,000 kilometers or 24,854 miles. 2,300 years ago, without spaceships or satellites, no GPS, just the sharp mind of one man and the universal language of mathematics, Eratosthenes proved that the Earth was round. Not only that, his calculation was only off by 75 kilometers, or 46 miles. It wasn't until 1961 when Yuri Gagarin went into space and looked down on the Earth that we could confirm with the naked eye what Eratosthenes had figured out all those centuries ago. The cosmonauts first words were, I see the earth, it is beautiful. That's the power of mathematics. It's easy to take for granted today because people see maths as being some tedious thing taught in school, but that's because they're being taught it in a very certain way. If mathematics is a language, children are being taught words one by one. They memorize phrases out of context. They don't see how it works in the real world. Maths is the most astonishing invention humanity has ever created. It's not just the language of the universe. It's not just a tool that built the entire modern world. Maths has the power to transform the human brain, to make it superhuman. And I'll prove it to you. Jordan Ellenberg is a mathematician and a professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He's written many books and he's written articles in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. He's made a name for himself by breaking down how mathematics speaks to us in the real world, in everyday life. In his book, The Power of Mathematical Thinking, Ellenberg tells the story of Abraham Wald. 
Wald was a Hungarian mathematician born in 1902 in Transylvania, which was then a part of Hungary and today is modern day Romania. I was today years old when I learned that Transylvania was a real place. Wald was homeschooled all the way to university where he earned his PhD in mathematics from the University of Vienna in 1931. He was a brilliant man ready to take on the world with his intellect. But there was just one problem. Wald was Jewish. With rising tensions because of you know who in Europe, he was forced to move to the United States in 1938, where he accepted a position at Columbia University. A year later, World War II starts. Wald is now a part of the US Army's statistical research group. He's assisting the war effort by helping the military solve technical problems. And the US military is facing a serious technical problem. Their planes are getting shot down by enemy fighters. Their early attempts to give the planes more armor just make them heavier and less maneuverable. So while they can take more punishment, they're easier targets and they can't fly as far on missions. It's a life and death problem for the pilots and a critical problem that the army scientists need to solve if they're going to stand a chance against the faster and more agile German planes. Enter Abraham Wald. It's 1943 and the American military is drowning in this problem. They don't even fully understand what's happening. Planes are falling from the sky and no one knows how to stop it. They're analyzing the problem, data's piling up and here's the kicker, they're staring at the wrong thing. Their planes come back riddled with bullets. They're losing the fight for the air and their pilots are exhausted. The planes that are coming back are showing a very clear pattern. The bullet holes, they aren't random. They're clustered at the fuselage, the wings and the tail. Hardly any of the bullet holes are on the engines. The brilliant minds in uniform look at this data and they think, hmm, let's reinforce those spots, that's where the holes are. Makes sense, right? If you put more armor where the damage is most frequent, job done. But Abraham Wald knew different. Keep in mind, he's not in the thick of battle. He's not sweating in the cockpit. He has no idea about dogfighting. But he sees what no one else does. The military bring him their data. They explain their reasoning and they show him the bullet holes. So, Mr. Mathematician, how do we stop our boys from falling out of the sky? Wald doesn't even blink. He looks at the holes, he looks at the data, and his answer is simple. You've got it all backwards. Everyone else that's looked at the problem has been missing the most important detail. The armor doesn't go where the holes are, it goes where the holes aren't. The army's people look at him like he's sprouting a second head. But Wald, he's cool as ice. He just lays it all out for them. The planes getting hit in all the places you've shown me they're the ones making it back. You're seeing the survivors, but the ones hit in the engines, they're not coming home. This way of looking at things is called a survivorship bias. The military brass were so focused on what they could see, the holes in the fuselage of the planes coming back, that they forgot what they couldn't see, the missing planes. The ones that didn't make it back, that was the key to the problem. Wald saw right away what everyone else had been missing. Just like Eratosthenes, he saw something others had seen and he came to a different conclusion. He didn't just see through the problem, he applied a different reasoning to find the solution. The math itself isn't exceptional, it's the ability to see outside the box. So what do Eratosthenes and Wald have in common? How did they see solutions to problems that stump countless others? The answer is mathematics. Common sense is a myth. It's just a term we use to describe what we already know. There's no such thing. It's not common at all. None of us know how much we don't know. There's the knowledge we share, and then there's the ability to create something without prior knowledge. That is the muscle that mathematics makes strong. Fluid intelligence, executive function. Mathematics is not just the language of the universe. Maths is to the brain what sports is to the body. You become agile, capable, adaptive. If you spend your whole life on the couch, walking upstairs will wind you, but a strong body will see you up Everest and back. Being fit in mathematics lets you scale any problem no matter how big. So what happens when you marry those two things? When you have a bona fide genius who doesn't just speak the language of mathematics, they're a maestro who can compose symphonies. In his book, The Joy of X, Stephen Strogatz tells this exact story. Europe, circa 1600, the scientific world is ablaze with excitement. Galileo and Kepler have just revolutionized the way we look at the heavens. And now mathematicians are trying to unravel the most mysterious puzzle so far, gravity. Why do planets stay close to their sun? Why do they move in ellipses? Why do apples fall from trees? Isaac Newton enters the chat. Newton, he's a curious young man who's always asking questions that nobody else will think of. He isn't just satisfied with theories or estimates, he wants precision. And here's what happened when the person asking the questions is a prodigy. 
At just 23, during the Great Plague, when Cambridge University was shut down in lockdown, Newton retreats to self-isolate at his family's farm. With no professors to guide him, no distractions, he starts playing around with ideas about motion, force, and falling objects. You know, bonk, the apple hits his head. He asks, how does the speed of an object change over time? How does its direction change when you apply force to it? And most importantly, can these changes be predicted with pinpoint accuracy? For most people, it's an impossible task. There are too many moving parts, too many variables, and they're like second language speakers at mass. Most people, they're only able to get by with everyday necessities. To draw a comparison, if the great minds at mathematics of that time were poets, Newton is a philosopher. He needed a new mathematical tool to explain how planets changed direction as they orbited the sun, so he invented it. He invented calculus. Now, calculus is actually fairly simple as a concept. It's the mathematics of change. Newton's big insight was, by breaking motion down into infinitely small parts, he could precisely calculate how things move, whether it's a planet hurtling through space or an apple thrown at a doctor. An apple a day keeps the doctor away if you throw it hard enough. So Newton's discovery solved an abstract problem, but it gave people a practical ability to understand how the forces of nature work. Calculus helps humanity consistently predict the future. If you know the position, speed, and forces applied to a moving object, you can predict where it will be at any moment in time. If you fast forward to today, Newton's work with calculus is still shaping our world. Engineers use it to design bridges that don't collapse under their own weight. Doctors use it to calculate the dose of a drug that will best treat a patient. Engineers use it to make airplanes that fly safely through the sky. Physicists use it to send rockets into space, put satellites into orbit, put people on the moon and beyond. Without calculus, none of this would be possible. One man, one step up the mountain of mathematics, a giant leap for all of us. And here's the thing that often gets overlooked. This isn't just about apples falling from trees or how the earth moves around the sun. Mathematics, especially the kind of mathematics that Newton pioneered, helps us do something critical for all humankind. Whereas before we guessed, now we knew. Where before we were slaves to gravity, now we had a way to master it. The moral of the story is not what maths gives us, it's how it lets us think. In children, maths develops something crucial, as I mentioned, fluid intelligence and executive function. Learning mathematics at an early age helps kids learn how to think more logically, how to manage tasks better. It even lets them control their impulses. Maths builds the brain's capacity for flexible thinking, what we call common sense, it's really just the ability to think up solutions in darkness without anyone else lighting the way for us. Just as Newton's discovery of calculus changed the world forever, teaching children how to think mathematically will transform their ability to think. They will solve problems faster. They will make better decisions. They will navigate all the challenges that life has to offer. The story of Newton's calculus reminds us that mathematics isn't some dry, crusty set of rules. It's a living, breathing way of speaking with the world and shaping it to fit us. Mathematics is a lens onto the world. It's something every child needs to develop because it will help them grow and help them adapt not just to school, but life. Just like Newton, who knows what the next step up the mountain will unlock? We're one genius away from completely changing the world. Material science will give us unlimited energy. It'll help us build space elevators, basically turning our scarcity economics into infinite possibilities. Quantum computing will unlock near unlimited computing power, giving us real AIs that could run entire cities like clockwork. The possibilities are endless, they are real, and they are one step away because you never know where the next genius will come from. But you can be sure that they will reach the next step of our evolution using mathematics. Being a mathematician allows you to think of solutions no one else can see. Not because you've got calculations that apply to every problem, but because you can see the problem through all the noise and you can build a solution out of thin air. Just by learning maths, every child improves their academic performance, decision-making, and their ability to adapt to the future. It's not just about studying hard in school. Today, parents have access to much more than ever before. Game-based edtech products like Matific show children that maths is fun and useful in real life. They give kids a positive early experience in the subject. So even if the child has a bad teacher, they can still learn that maths is played. They will learn the concepts on a fundamental level. Companies like Matific 
don't make maths fun. Maths is fun. We make learning it more enjoyable and less intimidating. When a child associates maths with the game that it is, they're more likely to feel confident and curious rather than fearful and frustrated. This positive relationship with maths fosters a lifelong love of learning and it prepares them for future challenges, from solving real-world problems to succeeding in a variety of careers. And who knows, the next Newton, Einstein or Tesla might be just around the corner. Maybe he or she is already here. Thank you so much for sticking with us to the end. If you enjoyed this video, give us a like, subscribe, and please comment down below. It really helps us grow and reach more children with Mativic. We've got lots more videos on ed tech, game-based learning, and mathematics coming your way. If there's another topic you'd like me to cover, let me know in the comments below. I've also linked the sources I used in this video so you can check them out in the description. And don't forget to try Mativic. It's a game-based math learning system for students aged 5 to 15. We have thousands of activities. We're in 10,000 schools, and hundreds of thousands of teachers, with millions of students solving billions of math problems every year. Matific is not a game that teaches math. Matific teaches that math is a game. So try it free for seven days. The link is in the description. Thanks again for watching. We'll see you next time. What is it about math? Why do so many kids grow to hate it? Imagine this. Imagine being made to memorize sheet music but never getting the opportunity to play. Imagine studying the lyrics, but never hearing the song. Next, imagine you have to memorize and reproduce these lyrics perfectly, or you fail. Your teacher makes you do it in front of the whole class. You mess up and everyone laughs. When a child tells us, I hate that, we at Matific say, good, you should hate that. You are correct in hating that. Students who hate math, or they're afraid of it, or they have math anxiety, will love the opportunity to instead play a game to learn. We've seen it before, all over the world. It's the ones who hate math that love Matific the most. That love of Matific slowly lets them understand that what they're enjoying about the experience is what math really is. And let's not forget, Matific can also adapt to stretch the abilities of kids gifted at math to make them even better at it. With over 2,000 games purpose-built to give meaning to math, there are no angry red crosses. There is no embarrassment in the face of failure. With Matific, students quickly learn that getting the answer wrong isn't a bug, it's a feature. Once students see math as a puzzle, they unlearn their anxiety and they start to think that maybe, just maybe, math can be fun. It's been true in so many countries around the world. The activities that Matific kids love in Australia are the same ones that kids love in the US, are the same ones that they love in Canada and Latin America and Africa and Europe and Asia. That's what we're bringing into your home, your school, and the lives of eager learners all over the world. The future of game-based education. Matific is not a game that teaches math. Matific teaches that math is the game. So let's change how our children view mathematics. And let's spread this message as far and wide as we can. Try Matific now absolutely free and watch your children become math superstars.